Welcome to the Global Journalism Seminars. This is The Briefing. In 1904, Maura arrived in St. Louis, Missouri from the Philippines. She had come for the 1904 World's Fair, but Maura wasn't attending the fair. She and her fellow Filipinas were there to be put on display. Tragically, Maura fell ill and passed away during her time there. Now, 120 years later, the Washington Post has revealed that a portion of Bauer's brain was retained by an anthropologist at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, along with the remains of 255 other people as part of a racial brains collection. Bauer's story is part of the Washington Post's investigative series, The Collection, which delves into the extensive repository of remains still held by the museum. But it is presented in comic book form, illustrated by a Filipino artist and translated into Tagalog. When we polled journalist fellows, 30% said they thought a sensitive story couldn't be told in comic book form. 30% said they had never translated their stories into other languages. Joining us today to discuss the Maurer story is project editor Casey Shaper, who headed up a team including reporters, artists, translators and publishers as part of the Post's Enterprise Reporting Division. Expert contributor Hannah Good, the Post's Journalism Comics editor, will also weigh in. That's the briefing. Let's begin. Hello and welcome back to the Global Journalism Seminars. I'm so happy to be starting this academic term uh, with Casey Shaper. Uh, Casey is a project editor working at the Washington Post to bring to life original investigations in a way that makes use of multiple platforms, skills and formats. Before working at the Post, Casey was a team leader at USA Today Network Design Center, where she managed two design teams and won multiple Society for Design Awards for her work. Casey, thank you for joining us so early in the morning. Thanks for having me. Before we go further, I actually, um, there was a mistake in that video that we need to correct. Uh, so let's start there. Uh, tell us, uh, it wasn't actually translated into Tagalog. What was it translated into? Uh, the story was translated into Filipino. Originally, we were, we set to, uh, to translate the story in Tagalog. However, as we started doing more research and I started asking more questions, uh, we were made aware that Tagalog is very much a regional language within Manila, the Manila area. And what our goal was, was to make this as accessible as possible to the Filipino people. And mm -hmm. so it was suggested to us that we make, uh, we use a language that is more widely used, which is the national language of the Philippines, Filipino, which is largely based in Tagalog, which is why there's often, often a misconception, but it does incorporate other languages within the Philippines. And I, you know, there's more than a hundred of them. So mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's kind of our way to honor all of the Filipino people that may have been part of this collection yeah. at the 1904 World's Fair. This is my every day is a school day moment because <laughs> I, I had absolutely no idea that there that that was a language option that existed. Um, so that's really, really interesting. Tell us a little bit more. We heard about Maura's story in the video, but we'll, what is the wider investigation that her story fits into? Yeah, absolutely. So in the video, it also talks about um, this larger collection. So the collection project in and of itself is focused on a racial brain collection that was started in, you know, the early 1900s by an anthropologist named Alice Heard Lichka. And this collection would ultimately grow and become a bigger collection of human remains. So mm -hmm. the you know, our project focuses on the brains itself, but we're also looking into, you know, the 30,000 plus human remains that are in the collection within the Smithsonian's um, helm. So the, the story really started when, you know, our incredible copy aide and freelance reporter, Claire Healy, found this story and of Maura and Jana mm -hmm. and sparked the project itself. So a couple of years ago, she came across Jana's story and her efforts to mark the graves of the Filipinos who were buried in St. Louis after she learned about what happened to them during the 1904 World's Fair. Mm -hmm. And she reached out hoping to do a story on her and her efforts. But when they spoke, Jana told Claire that she learned that four of the brains of the Filipino people who were there were removed and sent to the Smithsonian's U.S. National Museum, mm -hmm. which we would know now as the Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. 
And that seemed odd to Claire because we don't often hear about soft tissue remains in this sphere. We usually hear about bones and other skeletal parts. Uh, so she started asking questions to the Smithsonian, you know, why were they being collected? How many do you have? And lo and behold, luckily they sent her a spreadsheet. And that was when we really embarked the whole process. So she partnered with, you know, our reporters, Claire, uh, Nicole Dunka and Andrew Tran to do the reporting. So Nicole mm -hmm. was very much a partner in her reporting and they, they really ta uh, tackled this together. And Andrew Tran came in to do a lot of the data reporting and really breaking down these numbers and asking for more information and creating this database that we, we now have. So what they found in the spreadsheet would inspire the bigger effort. You know, there were men, women, children, fetuses in this collection, and many of them were indigenous people or other people of color, but so many of them just didn't have their identities reported because at the time of the collection, they were very much considered specimens. Mm -hmm. So it was very clear to the editors on this project and the reporters that we had to answer certain questions, you know, what exactly was the racial brain collection? Who started it? Why were the brains being collected in the first place? Who is now ultimately responsible for its care and its repatriation? But ultimately, what if we could find out who were these individuals in this collection? And luckily, one of them was Maura for us because we had not necessarily every piece of information about her, but we had enough information that we could pull together the story of the journey. Mm. How many of your stories these days start as a spreadsheet? <laughs> uh, I don't think that many. This was one <laughs> of those very rare instances. But I think if you were to ask our, our data team and our, our data reporters, they can probably... And they Might probably get a different, a different answer. answer for you. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I want to focus in on, on the Maura story that you guys zeroed in on. And, and perhaps while you're talking, I can and show a little bit about how that story was presented. But um, can you tell us um, a, a little bit about um, when you first heard this Maurer story, uh, what was your personal reaction to it? Uh, did you volunteer to get involved? Was it assigned to you? Um, how quickly did you know where you wanted to take this project? Yeah, so I first heard a little bit about this actually during an end of the year mixer when Claire was just starting to work on this with um, actually on her own before she started partnering with with others in the newsroom. So mm -hmm. she started telling me about this. I at the time did not hear about the Maura story. So I actually heard about it during a kickoff meeting that was held by one of the editors on this project. And okay. he, you know, was was laying down all of this information and telling us what they were hoping to do with it in terms of reporting. And when Nicole and Claire really started telling the story, I had a very personal reaction to it mm -hmm. just because I don't often hear about stories of Filipino and as a Filipino American myself, mm -hmm. you know, I felt the need to tell this story. You know, yeah. I felt like this was a shared history. It's not just a Filipino story or an American story. This is very much a world story. This is mm -hmm. our shared history. And it was a reaction I don't often get on projects mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm often assigned, you know, the things that I, I'm working on. But in this case, I felt the need to be on this project. I just, I felt like I had to honor her somehow. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, as the only Filipino on the project's team, I felt like this was probably my chance to be, to tell a story of my people as well. And mm -hmm. so I did request to be assigned if the stars aligned and my, my schedule allowed for it. And luckily they did. Yeah. There's um, something we often hear um, out of newsrooms as a frustration from journalists is um, people questioning their objectivity when when a story is personal to them. Did, was at, at any point did that happen to you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I 
had to remind myself very often that, mm. you know, this is not my story. This mm. is, you know, the story of Mauda. And mm. while I do want to honor her story and make sure that it's told accurately, mm. I did have to take myself out of it fairly often. So, you know, I had to question my own biases. I had to wonder if the approach that I'm taking is for my benefit or for the Mm -hmm. benefit of telling her story or for the benefit of the audience. And even certain things like, you know, the language, for example, you know, if I wanted to say, to tell it in Tagalog, that was my bias because that's the language that I speak, not necessarily the language of, of the wider audience. And so I did have to remove myself and remind myself every day that, Hey, yes, you're part of this, but you are not the story. Yeah. But do you think the staff, at the, on the other hand, also appreciated how much you were bringing to the story in terms of nuance and understanding? I mean, I think so, but I think everybody did. You know, everybody mm. came to this project very passionate about what we were doing and the stories that we were telling. And so, you know, there were certainly times where things got contentious because we were all passionate about, yeah. you know, how this was going to be told and how this was going to be, you know, presented. But I think everybody brought different points of view. And I think that's why this was so successful because we all really were able to evaluate what point of view would work or challenged each other's point of view. You know, what gaze are we using? What, what biases are we, are we putting out there? And so um, we also used each other and leaned on each other to make sure that, Hey, maybe take a step back for a second and, you know, just, just take those glasses off and maybe take a walk. <laughs> yeah. This, this uh, uh, goes to me preaching uh, all year that I think journalism is collaboration now in the 21st century. So I love hearing this. Um, our speaking of <laughs> preaching all year, we have uh, 10 new journalist fellows in the room downstairs, and they're all about to embark on their own journalistic projects uh, about the future of journalism. And I wondered if you had um, any advice for them, um, particularly when you thought about um, uh, defining the audience and the impact of this project Um what did you have in mind? Those are kind of two different directions to (laughs) to take an answer in. You choose the one that that feels best for you. Yeah, I mean, I knew sitting in that first meeting that there was already a worldwide effort for museums to return artifacts or repatriate remains that were stolen or unethically acquired in the past. Mm -hmm. So off the bat, I knew that this needed to have a global audience because I Mm -hmm. knew that there could be a global impact depending on one, how the story was received and two, how the Smithsonian, you know, would react to Mm -hmm. all of this. And so, you know, we're talking about the biggest museum institution and research centered in the United States, not to mention Mm. 30 plus countries represented in a larger collection. So I knew immediately global audience, we can't just focus in on the American audience. And because this was very much part of our history, I wanted to reach out to both older and younger audiences. But that also meant you had an uphill battle in trying to find the different ways and mediums these stories could be presented. Because, you know, if you know, we all know that older audiences get their information very differently from younger audiences. Younger audiences tend to, you know, get their information immediately on their phone, on their socials, um, and in very different, you know, mediums, right? They mm-hmm. they like to look at things a little bit more passively. And so that's kind of what I had to think about. And I think that's what my best advice would be was to really think about the audience and the type of story that you're telling, right? First, think about the possible impact and then how do you reach the audiences that you actually hope to reach? And so ultimately, I wanted to provide an entry point to, into this project through the means and mediums in which our, our audiences already receive their information. That's why you can access the project in so many ways. You can read it digitally, you can read it in print, you can watch it in video form, listen it, to it on a podcast, but every you know medium that you use, you'll always find new information. So mm. definitely think about your audience when you're writing those stories and researching what you wanna do. Mm. How did thinking about your audience um, guide this project? I'm guessing the translation portion was was in response. 
Uh, I think for this particular story, yes. I think the translation is one of them. The the chance to do the, the video format was also one of them. You know, mm. we actually rarely translate stories in at the post. You know, I think this is why it was so special. When I first suggested translating the story, it part of it was because I we felt a responsibility to make Maura's story as accessible as possible to the Filipino people. But it was mm. also a way for us to help the people who were directly affected by this story, you know, the Filipino people, to feel like it was theirs and to have it in their mother tongue was very important to us as much as we wanted to, you know, tell the story in Kankanai, which is what Maura would have spoken. We knew that that was a smaller sect of of people, but right. you know, there were other Filipino groups in the 1904 World's Fair, so we wanted to be very fair to that. Mm. Um, we also made the animated videos of the story and in both languages, which I'm I'm very proud of and very thankful for the people who are involved in making that. Filipino people still very much rely on video format to mm. get their news and you know in, in addition to social and so I wanted to be able to provide that medium for the audience and then you know also knowing that there are younger you know viewers out there not necessarily those looking for news that may come across the story and see this animated video and learn not only about Maura but the 1904 World's Fair this collection and what happened to them so mm. yeah yeah stra stra strategic serendipity uh <laughs> planning um that's probably a really good point for us to bring in um uh Hannah Good is waiting in the wings uh Hannah is the Washington Post's uh journalism comics editor hi Hannah um Hello. so I, I know everybody is um, is going to ask immediately, what on earth is a journalism comics editor? Um, and before you answer, a couple of people are, are telling us that the sound is, is low. So I guess we should uh, just speak up a little bit um, and then you can tell us uh, that we're being too loud later. <laughs> Yes, so my my formal title is designer focused on comics and illustrated reporting. Uh, so I do other things, but my primary job is to think deeply about how we can use illustrated mediums to tell stories like Maldas. Yeah, what what um, those those illustrations are obviously incredibly haunting. What went into the commissioning process of finding Ren Galino and deciding to go with her? How many different designers were in the mix? Yeah, so um, I did, man, a, a couple weeks of research uh, into Filipino artists we knew immediately. We wanted to commission an artist either from the Philippines or a Filipino-American artist. So initially I considered, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so. We whittled that down to three that I presented to the entire team, along with my co-editor, Jenna Parag. And um, I found Ren through a collection that she did actually in Tagalog. Um, so I couldn't read it. <laughs> so I was just looking at the piece that she had made. The collection was um, about uh, climate change and its effect on the Philippines. And it was like a science fiction piece that was kind of a dystopian, uh, you know, science fiction. And even though I couldn't read it, I could just feel the emotion so viscerally. And, um, you know, I knew that we wouldn't be able to portray Malda's face because we don't have photos of her and the way that she was able to portray um, the human form really struck me. And yeah. so that's that's why Ren was the standout. Uh, and when I when I presented her to the team, I, everyone agreed. Uh, and and upon, we we spoke with her initially and from the initial conversation, uh, it was just so clear that Ren was the right collaborator. Yeah, um, sounds like it. Uh, uh, communicating emotion is probably something that journalists are not particularly good at, and that maybe that's a good reason for more uh, collaborations like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, we knew that uh, we we didn't want to ascribe emotions to mm. people whose inner thoughts and feelings we didn't know, mm. um, but we could portray what we did know. We we didn't have 
you know, Maura's own words. We didn't, you know, we couldn't tap into her internal dialogue. We, of course, couldn't interview her. So, um, you know, in that ways, we had to be quite uh, neutral or unspecific in many ways, but the emotionality of the piece could come through, uh, you know, when we were portraying her community, uh, you know, we did have newspaper excerpts uh, showing that they like mourned her and and they cried deeply. And so, um, you know, we did know in some ways what people were thinking and feeling at the time. Um, and we also did have, you know, historical photos to reference in that way. Okay. Um uh, you you mentioned the archives and a question for both of you really. Um, when you did re-illustrate some of those archives, um, there was some pretty problematic original language, kind of calling um, the the people put on display savages or uh, calling their funeral rites weird. Was there a discussion around how you were going? whether or not to include that original language and 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 how you were going to present it yeah we we had a lot of questions about that from the start um that those conversations started with the accession cards which are um the record cards that actually label what the remains are so many of those cards identified people with racist language and terms and if we were going to include those cards um you know, where are we going to censor them, et cetera. And that conversation was, you know, heightened talking about the newspaper um, excerpts because, you know, that that language was just like so violently racist. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the entire point of using the comic was so that, you know, we didn't want to just, uh, you know, put forward historical photographs that were taken through this, like, colonialist, very racist, like objectifying gaze as neutral. We mm -hmm. wanted to interrogate that position in the first place. And so, you know, we we questioned is replicating and putting forward the language of the newspapers, is that doing the same thing? Are we, you know, objectifying and putting Mauda and her community back on display? And so ultimately we made the decision to preserve uh some of the language in the newspaper and you know put put that forward to be honest and truthful about how normalized and ingrained the racism was and how there was just no, there's no question like the, you know, the way that um, the, they were put on display was, was racist. Like there, you can't question those motivations because it's right there in front of you. Yeah. Um, and we also knew that um, if we were going to do it, we would need to explain it to readers. So um, in the story, uh, in the uh, bibliography, um, you know, behind the story that we published, we explained that choice. Um, and then we also explained it in all the notes and the various mediums, since this mm -hmm. was a very multi-platform story. Yeah, yeah. Were there other bones of contention that you had to negotiate as a team? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely the perspective of the photographs. Um, let's see, uh, not not knowing, uh, you know, not seeing Mata's face, we had to question, you know, how much of it we were going to show. Um, Ren was the one who said that she really wanted to show her eyes, and so uh, this repeated motif of eyes that you see was was very much Ren's um, Ren's artistic contribution and. Uh, you know, she said, like, you know, we didn't want to ascribe too much emotion to the eyes, like I said, but we wanted to see her eyes. We wanted to see part of her so that the audience could feel in some ways connected. Mm -hmm. um, we, every detail that you see in the illustrations was intensely fact-checked. Um, Jenna Perog, in particular, did a lot of archival research Um Nicole and Claire reached out to uh, community members, uh, Tony Bagon, whose uh, ancestors were at the fair, and he is, uh, is, you know, knows so, so, so much about what they went through and endured and showed us, you know, clothing that they would have worn. Um, mm -hmm. We showed him some of the images to fact check to make sure that uh, they were, you know, culturally correct, um, culturally sensitive and competent. So, uh, you know, gathered around um, Mato's body at the funeral home. Uh, he told us that they would have been wearing, you know, red, like ceremonial cloths, not, you know, the clothes that we saw them in at the World's Fair. So, you know, every 
basically be, because we were trying to recreate these scenes that we don't have 100% visual evidence for, um, a, a, everything needed to be to the absolute best of our ability and in fact check to the gills. Yeah. Casey, do you remember any other bones of contention? Yeah, I mean, I think there were certainly a lot, you know, we, I think we kept going back and forth a little bit on, you know, whose perspective we wanted to our readers to, you know, have follow the journey on like, do you want to be in Maura's shoes trying to go through this journey? Did you want to be, you know, just an outsider perspective? And I think that was one of the things that while it was so easily agreed upon. It was definitely something we had to discuss very much so because this is not, you know, your typical, it's not your typical comic, right? This is, this mm -hmm. is very much an investigation. This was, you know, we, we had to be very upfront about what we knew and what we didn't know. Mm -hmm. But as Hannah said, we, we couldn't prescribe emotion where we didn't know what the emotion was. We couldn't provide dialogue where dialogue didn't exist. And so mm -hmm. every piece of dialogue that you see there was published and it, we published it in its original form. Um, but we really wanted to make sure that this was nonfiction, right? Mm -hmm. This, this had to be accurate. And so whatever journey you took you know that that was kind of the point of of making sure that it was the journey that we told and not necessarily what happened to her ultimately or what happened to Jonna ultimately or what the Washington Post did ultimately mm. it was this was the journey of the people who were at the 1904 World's Fair and what happened to some of them mm. um, ultimately ending up in this collection and so you know Ren really wanted to make sure that she didn't just illustrate a photo, right? She really mm -hmm. wanted to provide a different perspective. We all wanted to provide a different perspective and challenge, like Hannah said, challenge that perspective. And so the idea here was to kind of break down that fourth wall and allow the reader to feel as though they were going through this journey. So whoever mm -hmm. you felt a connection to in this story, you know, that was the point is, how do you make sure that that person feels like they are part of the journey every step of the way? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, that was, that was a very uh, long conversation at the very beginning, because we, we knew that this was going to be a challenge and especially using illustration um, in, instead of photography, because we simply didn't have enough photography to really tell this, this journey. So I think Hannah and Jenna and everybody else involved in this did a, a fantastic job in the decision to make sure that, um, you know, we, we put the audience in a different scope mm. in, in this whole thing was, was very smart. Yeah. It's not every story you could do this with, is it? That it, 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 there are very specific aspects to the story that made it possible to unpack it and unpack the emotion um, and unpack the history through art. Um, I'm, I'm imagining how that would work um, on a present day story. And you're right that, that what you were saying about, um, you know, the, the, the line between the uh, filling in blanks <laughs> that, that, artists naturally want to do that you can't do that uh hmm, fascinating um before you go hannah and do stick around because there are lots of questions coming in for you as well um but before you go we polled our journalists um our alumni and asked them if they thought you could tell a story in comic book form a journalistic story 30% of them said no um what what would you what would you like to tell them about uh, telling journalistic uh, comic book stories. Yeah, this is my favorite thing. I'm, I'm <laughs> every every day. I explain this, you know, to to folks within the post and outside the post. It's like you know my my life's work. So I I'd hope that after seeing Mauda, the work speaks for itself. Mm. Um, but you know, we're we're not the first ones to do it. There have been 
you know, decades of innovation in this space. So um, Art Spiegelman's Mouse came out in 1980. Like, what is that? For, 40 years ago, um, you know, Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis uh, Insider won the first illustrated reporting Pulitzer in 2021, illustrating a Uyghur woman's escape um, from a Chinese internment camp. So mm -hmm. I would really point to the fact that comics and the medium of illustrated reporting, it's not a gimmick. Um, you know, it's not just kind of, you know, a, a smoke show to, to get you interested in it. Comics have a unique and uh, singular way of telling stories that connects to people's deep emotions, mm -hmm. the way that you have to distill the human face down to its, you know, barest essentials, just, you know, for the most part, eyes, nose, and mouth. It's, it's not realism, but that abstraction allows your brain to input yourself into the story. It makes it that much more personal. And, uh, you know, the thing that I love about comics journalism in particular is that it, you know, all of these things that are easy to take for granted in journalism, um, you know, this kind of uh, voice from nowhere or, um, you know, a, a lot of the work that goes into it can be made invisible by how like polished and beautiful the final piece is, uh, which is amazing. But in comics journalism, you are laying all of that bare. You are showing your work. You are showing the human hand behind it. And I think that creates an intimacy with your readers and mm -hmm. a closeness and a trust that can't be replicated mm -hmm. by other mediums. I have about a hundred more questions, but uh, I, I also realize that I've taken up more than half the time already and a lot of people want to ask you questions too. So um, just before we go downstairs, I want to ask um, on behalf of Ira, um, how do young journalists cover stories like these um, that require extensive research and at the same time uh, editorial precision to maintain the objectivity? Um, do ha, what kind of resources would you need at your disposal to do justice to to this kind of project? Yeah, I mean, I I think this is one of those great examples because Claire very much is a young journalist, and she you know she found this story, um, you know, in her freelance time, and so this this is just goes to show that ideas can come from anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what needs to happen is get the idea in front of as many people as possible, especially people that you trust, right? Mm. Find the right editor who you believe can help guide you through this process and mm. make sure that the reporting that you're doing is headed in the right direction. You're asking the right questions and then have other people uh, in your support group to, to identify exactly what is needed here. So in that way, um, I think that Aaron Weiner and you know David Fallis and Sarah Childress they were very much the ch the editor champions on this because they saw the potential, which is why they put it through a project proposal um, and said, "Look, this is what we have. We could tell it traditionally and just have a mm -hmm. word format with some photos, but this could really be something else, and we would very much like." some resources to be put on this. And mm -hmm. so I think it's one being very honest about what you're able to do, being very honest about what you would like to do and pulling in people who can make that vision come to life. Mm -hmm. So whether that's photographers or videographers or a comics editor or, mm -hmm. you know, illustrators, I think that you need to have a little bit of a vision and then yeah. al allow others to join that vision with you. And then how do you keep them, Casey, on, uh, on how do you keep everyone pulling in the same direction? I think a lot of that is one, making sure that everybody is informed. You know, I always started um, all of our, our project meetings with a quick, you know, round table update. That way we know what every single uh, team and individual is, is doing on their end and what they're hoping to contribute. And that way we can all sort of ask questions or, or provide suggestions as to, um, you know, what they're currently working on. So every day there was, you know, what is the reporting update? What is the editing update? What is the comics update? What 
is the photography update? What is the strategy update? You know, mm-hmm. so that way everyone is informed and making sure that that doesn't just happen in you know, a formal meeting, but that's also documented, you know, either in your, if you have a Slack channel or a Teams channel, making sure that that's documented there and reaching out to the people who may not have been informed immediately, making sure that you're checking on them, but also making sure that you're invoking some sort of passion in these individuals, right? I think that's one of the things that we did very well here is Yes, we were all very passionate about the stories that we were telling in the project itself, Mm -hmm. but every single contributor here brought their expertise to the table. Mm -hmm. And in no point in the project did we ever actually tell someone, this is what you're going to do, right? It was, here's what we're thinking. What do you think you can bring to the table, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that allowed people to tap into their own creativity and their own, you know, processes and their own passions in Mm. order to feel like they're contributing something they feel very much that they own rather than something that they were told to do. Yeah. I think that's, you know, and you can tell just by the way that, that Hannah was explaining, you know, Ren's vision and all of this, that, you know, everyone brought in their ideas and that, that really was, keying in on that, invoking some sort of passion into some, uh, in mm. someone. Mm. Um, I want to bring in our Jonas fellows downstairs to ask their questions live. And I thought perhaps we could start with uh, Francisca from Chile. Um, Fran, what did you want to ask? You're still on mute, um, which is very normal. It happens <clears throat> all the time. Take it away. Hi. That was okay. Congratulations for this great, great project. And um, I wanted to ask about the, the metrics. How did uh, both projects uh, engage our audience? I mean, the scrolling version versus the animated version. And when, when you compare that uh, analytics data with uh, the performance of the more, more, more traditional stories that are part of the same project. Hmm. I know you can't share with us any of the actual metrics, but perhaps we could t- t- tell us a little bit about what you decided to measure when you set out. Yeah, we certainly wanted to measure impact over metrics overall, because this is what we consider public service journalism, right? We, we're not out there to, you know, just sit, throw out a number and say, oh, we're we're hoping to get a million views on this video or anything like that. We wanted to make sure that the whoever got to the story felt the impact and understood the history, the the consequences of of these actions and what and learn what is being done with these these brains and other remains in this collection, not just at the Smithsonian but around the world and to challenge your your ideas about, oh, well, this was okay in the past. We know it's not okay now, but how are we going to change it, right? So we wanted to make sure that the impact is is less on this is how many people viewed the story or this is how many people decided to subscribe because of this story. We wanted to focus in on what is the ultimate impact of this reporting. Part of that is what is the Smithsonian going to do after we publish this story, one of which is they returned one of the brains, you know, Mary Sarah's brain was, was repatriated. And we're, that's something that we're very, very proud of. So that was the, that was the ultimate metric that we were using is impact. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Hong Chao, uh, who is uh, uh, from China. Um, Hong Chao has a question that kind of echoes a question that Shauna Ray has as well. So I'll add once you're done. And uh, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for making the great story. Uh, my question is related, as, as um, Catherine just mentioned, um, you already answered the part of impact. I guess uh, my question is more about um, how journalists or a newsroom at large make decisions on money, on budget control, because each decision you just made adding a new uh, translation, uh, adding the graphics, adding, adding the comics, they all involve money. And we have been very shy in journalism to talk about that. And how did you make decisions? What are mm-hmm. you to decide? I'm going to add another layer. And mm-hmm. 
how how do how do you make decisions about how to assign money but but resources as well i guess is part of the question and i'll add from shauna um this is always the elephant in the room but uh if you're an indie publication how do you get the money to do something like this yeah i mean i hannah if you want to speak a little bit on you know, kind of next gen's role in all of this because they were very much a a fantastic partner in you know providing funding for not just Ren uh, to illustrate, but also for Christian to help translate all of this. But you know, I think one of the one of the things here is also tap into your own resources, right? I think one of the things you know, having worked in with so many newsrooms now. One of the things that we take for granted is we focus so much on someone's title and what they do on a daily basis that we often don't ask what else they can bring to the table. And so, you know, when you're looking at, you know, let's just say for me, for instance, when you look at my title, it's projects editor. So my my job is to to lead the project and, and think about the audience strategy. But I also speak Tagalog. And so I had, you know, the ability to be an editor on the translation. I had um, design background. And so I had, you know, the, the ability to, to kind of take a, become a second pair of eyes on some of these, these visuals. So, you know, definitely ask your newsroom, you know, okay, this is what your role is, but what else, you know, what's your background? What else can you do? Is, do you have interest in doing this? So definitely look into your your internal resources before you, you look outward. Yeah, and uh, Casey hinted at our next generation team, which is uh, what I was on when I participated in this project. Um, yeah, K Casey and the editors really took advantage of cross-department collaboration to access funding for it. So um, we knew that, you know, next generation as a team, we knew that we were interested in this because we're invested in galvanizing younger readers. And so um, the project editors like Casey and the um, and Dave really wanted to take advantage of that um, and kind of, you know, spread out the cost associated with the project so that we could really maximize our impact with what we had. Um, I will also say, you know, the post is on indie publication, so that's not the perspective <laughs> I'm speaking from, um, but I do have a lot of colleagues who work in comics and illustrated reporting who do have fewer resources to associate with this, and they still get it done. Uh, so I will point you to Borderless Magazine, which is a nonprofit magazine in Chicago based on or, uh, focused on immigration, and Michelle Kanar and Nisa Ree published uh, several comic books focused on community impact. Uh, they did that with grants. Um, Brian Williamson at Voice of America, not an indie publication, but they do all of it in-house. Brian is a comic artist himself. Uh, so talking about using what you have in-house, uh, he develops everything, he illustrates everything. Um, and also uh, they, they translation is the only thing that they hire out. So um, other people are doing it with smaller budgets and a smaller scale. It is not just huge productions like The Post. So Brian Williamson actually has a question for you, Hannah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Brian says, uh, you, you've worked on a lot of short form, um, shorter form comic journalism series at The Lily. This was a much longer form project. What takeaways do you have about the differences between short and long form? What a joy to hear from Brian. Um, <laughs> Yes, so this was uh, far and away the, the biggest project that I worked on, period, but as a comic in particular. Um, so I would say a short form for us, it's usually like a three week turnaround. This, you know, was six months for the comics version, much longer for the reporting. Mm -hmm. So with uh, a longer piece like this, uh, much more rounds of revisions. Um, there has to be so much more discipline about the workflow. So what we found is that every change had a cascade of effects and it mm -hmm. impacted so many other people. And mm -hmm. so I would say Jenna Parag was, uh, my co-editor, was really our logistics queen. She, um, you know, had 
she kept these like regimented, beautiful lists of like, this needs to change here and here and here. Um, lock your changes by this date. We are not sending anything back to Ren after this. Wow. Okay. You know, so it's really about like, um, you know, balancing the demand on our illustrator, making sure that, you know, Ren isn't doing 25 million uh, changes, mm. you know, rounds of changes rather. Um, but like, let's keep it to I won't say the actual number. What was it though? I really want to know. What was the actual number? <laughs> I mean, like, like I don't have a count, but very many, but More we did three. try to minimize it. <laughs> More than three. More than three. So, you know, we did have, I, I will say, something that um, keeps that in check um, mm. at the sketch phase, like, mm. Uh, that's when changes are the most viable, the most feasible. And so we really emphasize like, you know, we ended up changing the structure quite a bit in, in that portion. And after that, it was primarily like fact checking things. Mm -hmm. So all of the, you know, decision making about how to tell the story, we try to front load it, especially in longer pieces like this. Yeah. Just a really practical question. Brian has a follow up, but, but just a really practical question on the revision rounds. Generally speaking, when you're commissioning an illustrator to work with them, you know, you'll have your upfront contract and generally speaking, they'll 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 put a clause in there naming a number of revision rounds that they're willing to go through. Usually it's around three. Uh, um, that's clearly not going to be possible on such a multi-format project, what would you advise in commissioning um, an illustrator that you want to work with? What kind of contract clauses would you advise that journalists look to incorporate to make it possible to collaborate? Yeah, so it does really need to be front loaded and the expectations need to be clearly communicated. So with Ren, we really told her like, this is an artistic pursuit, but above all else, it needs to be journalistically accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would, I I can kind of put my artist hat on as a person who has been commissioned <laughs> to do other things. Mm. Um, ideally, it's, you know, ideally the publication is putting that clause in there, but um, artists also are often, unfortunately, the ones who have to advocate for that. So I would say as an artist, if that clause is not in the contract, ask for it um, as a publication, front load it to put it in there. And generally the rule is after, you know, like three rounds, uh, each additional revision is a certain rate or whatever. Um, but it for something like this, it is realistically going to be more than that. So like front loading, just the, the scale of it and the scope of what we're doing and what the priorities are so that there are no surprises mm. or as few surprises as possible. Casey, from a budget management perspective or from a project management perspective, uh, is it useful to have? Uh, look, we can only go back to Ren this many times, guys. So get it right. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, like Hannah said, front loading all of these things, but also setting the expectation at the very, very beginning, not just with the illustrator, but with the rest of the team, right? Mm -hmm. So as Hannah said, there was a cascading effect with every time something changed, mm -hmm. right? So we knew that this story was going to be in digital form in two languages, mm -hmm. in video form in two languages, in print, um, not just in the book formats, but also in a, in a tab. And so there were very uh, many ways that we had to alter something once something had already been started. So, yeah. you know, like Hannah said, in that sketch process, that was super, you know, super important that all of the changes happen there. But of course, you know, as reporting changes or as fact checks happen, we know that things have to change. That's something we just, as journalists, we're going to have to live with mm -hmm. and have to accept. And so, you know, setting that expectation ahead of time and say, okay, as soon as you hit this phase, it's yeah. going to affect design, it's going to affect print, it's going to affect video, it's going, and it's, it's going to be this amount of time. And that's something mm -hmm. that I um, tried to do as best as I could, which was, okay, in order to make this change, it's going to cause two extra days in order to make this change, it's going to cause two extra hours of work on the dev side, you know, it's things like that is weighing what that change is going to be. And is that change worth it? Yeah. Um, you know, if obviously if it's a factual change, you have no choice, you have to do it. But if it's something like a tiny change between, you know, should we have this house in the background or not have this house in the background, if it's an artistic choice to have it in there, you know, those are the things you have to weigh after you hit a certain phase in that, in that process. Right. 
Right. Did you know going into this as project editor what those phases would be and where those milestones were and what the cutoffs would be? Or was this something you had to learn as, as you went? And and perhaps, yeah, let, let me let you answer before I go any further. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are, I, I knew, at least in my role, we have sort of three main phases. So we have the pre-production phase, which is where a lot of the um, ideation happens, a lot of the reporting happens, and a lot of the writing, and then we enter production phase, which obviously takes most of the time. That's mm -hmm. when all of the teams are coming together and they're cross, you know, collaborating. So that means, you know, Hannah's now working with the design team and the dev team and, you know, all of the, the editors, to, because every change now has to um, be agreed upon and so that production process takes a long long time um, but I think one of the things that I learned in this particular process is you know this was something we we had never done before we'd never done an, an entirely investigative you know piece that is fully illustrated like this and so some of the things we did have to learn along the way mm -hmm. we didn't know that we had to you know be done with certain things at a certain time in order to make our deadline but ultimately we we kind of had to also you know work with with Ren's schedule and the schedule of of the others other people on the team because in a newsroom like this is is often not the only thing that an individual is working on they're working on other things and so it's prioritization as well yeah um i'm going to go back to brian's follow-up question um he says now that you've worked on this longer form project, are there lessons that you would apply to shorter form illustration project? Oh, what a good question. Um, yeah, I think for me, it spoiled me a little bit. We had uh, Audrey Valbuena is uh, our developer who made this for web and it is so beautiful. And so ever since we put it out, I cannot stop thinking about how we can make uh, future comics more beautiful, more accessible, um, you know, more dynamic online. And so um, less, less of a, a lesson than just like, I don't know, I guess like what I learn from Audrey every day. And so I'm, you know, I'm thinking a lot more about how we can really like up our, our development game um, with comics because our, our shorter form things because of bandwidth, uh, we're, you know, we're using kind of like static uh, comic panels and then we embed the alt text. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's not a guarantee that they're legible at every size unless we do that manually. Um, and so for me, it just showed me so much of the possibilities of what comics can feel like to read online. Um, and that's a lot of, of what I'm thinking about. Yeah. I don't know, Casey, I'm wondering if you have a better answer about like lessons learned uh, about if we do this again kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the lessons learned is is how do you make this as easy a process as possible, even if it's in the, <laughs> in the much shorter format, right? So, you know, Hannah brought up Audrey, who was very much brilliant in this whole thing, you know, we there were certain things that we had to discuss like font you know what do we use you know a, a regular font that is going to live on forever and you know won't alter the the look and feel of of this you know 10 years down the line is it going to be you know read, readable right like as, as as Hannah said and so I think you know one of the things we have to think about is you know how do we make a process out of this so that it's not learning as you go every single time you know mm -hmm. it's you know who's going to be writing the alt text how do we write the alt text how do we you know in what yeah. order do we need to uh to put these panels in you know when you get a photoshop file is it going to be a, a merged file or you know does it need to be certain layers and how are those layers um going to be ordered. And so I think there's a little bit of a um, learning how to systemize, I guess, mm, <laughs> mm. all of this and making sure that it becomes a process that can be repeated um, time and time again. And so as you work on these things, you know, even if it's a short form, the, the process becomes shorter and shorter and easier. Mm. So wait, I actually can't believe I didn't ask this question. Uh, what did you decide about the font? And <laughs> is, is that the font that's going to be used on future projects? 
So we decided to stick with Franklin, which is our everyday um, post font. It is a sans serif. Um, Jenna and I, as like comics junkies who like love the medium, were really gunning for more of a handwriting font. Um, but the decision, uh, Audrey in particular, was like, no, this page cannot break. <laughs> like, if, mm. you know, decades in the future when the Washington Post is still changing and changing, like, I'm hoping that this will last, this will persist. Um, and the best hope that we have of this is kind of uh, doing it as much like our other stories as possible. Um, yeah. The maintenance will be easier. So Audrey was grounding us there. Yeah, Audrey um, is wise. I wouldn't have thought of that. She is super wise. <laughs> um, and so in future comics projects, um, as we do it now, uh, you know, our, our standard, we we do use a lot of handwriting font because they're static JPEGs. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, that means we embed our alt text in the images themselves. A lot of the comic artists we work with have their own handwriting fonts, uh, some of them hand letter. And so I'm not ready to give that up yet, but it is a prescient question. It is something that I'm actively thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, what, what the feasibility of adding comic sponsors into our yeah. workflow. Yeah. And then the other thing you brought up there that I think is important we chat about is um, how did you think about uh, the accessibility um, of, of this project? Um, is it just the alt text or were there other um, considerations made around making it accessible to uh, blind news audiences? Yeah. Um, so Audrey is uh, an expert in accessibility. And so she considered a lot about making the page lighter so that it's easier to load in places like the Philippines, uh, in places around the world, uh, you know, without high internet bandwidth necessarily. Um, you know, she also considered things like high and low contrast. So uh, you'll notice as much as possible, there is white text on a black background, black text on a white background. Um, and then uh, I'll let Casey explain more. We translated the alt text. Um, Casey translated the alt text into Filipino. So I will I will let her talk wow. more. Yeah, I mean, I, so to be clear, like Christian Benitez was very much like our lead translator in all of this. You know, my role was very much to be the editor and make sure that, you know, what we put in Filipino is going to be the same not necessarily one-to-one, -one, but um, it's interpreted in the same way and then with the same purpose that the English was, was done. And so one of the things that we did was, you know, I very much championed if we're going to translate this into Filipino, the whole thing has to be in Filipino. You know, it, what it comes from the the headline to the little toggle that says, you know, read this in Filipino, or you know, all the way down into the credits boxes and the and the information down at the bottom, the sensitivity clauses, all of those things. Um, but including the alt text as well, because if you're reading this in Filipino, I would assume that you'd also want to uh, be able to access the the alt text in Filipino because you know, there, that's just part of accessibility, right? You can't just mm -hmm. um, decide to use one language and then flip it in order to make it accessible. You, um, you know, if you're going to go and translate something, you have to go all in, including, you know, alt text, intro, outro, all of the things. Mm -hmm. Um, there are uh, many questions that remain, um, and I'm very sorry to you, to those of you who I didn't get to, but I'm going to take um, uh, as our final question one that many different people have asked in many different ways, including um, Omar and Christina downstairs and somebody online um, essentially saying, um, what other stories can we tell in this way? Um, and perhaps the most extreme version of this question was someone saying, could you tell the Gaza story this way? Um, so um, I would encourage you to look into the work of Joe Sacco, who is the journalist who coined the term comics journalism. Um, Joe reported from Palestine and Gaza uh, from the 90s on. And so the origin of comics journalism really has um, its roots in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, Joe also 
you know, really revolutionarily, uh, he was not Palestinian, he was Maltese American, but he, you know, drew himself in conversation um, with the folks he interviewed in Gaza. Um, and so, yeah, that that really set a precedent for like what it means to tell stories in this medium. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, going along with that, I would say the rubric that we use um, to determine what the value add of comics could be for a story. Um, it is often um, what, what can we not access visually any other way? So do we not have photos? Are cameras not allowed? Um, is it a recollection that there's not photographic or video evidence of? Um, are there anonymous sources or people whose identities we want to protect mm -hmm. uh, while maintaining the immersive of the story that we're trying to get to. Um, and then, of course, the question of uh, telling, you know, showing our work, which is what I love so much about comics journalism. Are we are we trying to do something really unique where we're playing with perspective, uh, we're including ourselves in the story so that we're really showing how we did the work, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, like I said, is really Joe Sacco's legacy. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think I got everything. But, Brilliant, um, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Casey and Hannah, thank you so, so much for your time this morning. We really appreciate you. Um, and we'll be back next week. Thank you both. And well done. What a great project. Yeah.